Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. We actually have two, we actually have three time zones going on here um, today, which uh, we're really excited uh, to have the show for you today. We're going to be talking about a lot of exciting uh, topics that um, are probably going to surprise you. Um, and so let's get our uh, my my amazing co-host and an amazing veterinarian and uh, and and animal advocate, Dr. Ian Billinghurst. Good morning, Rob. Good morning and good evening and good afternoon to everybody out there. Yes. And I believe for our, our guest, it's late in the evening. That's right. She, yep, she is in the UK. So without further ado, because it is late for her and she's been so gracious to be on with us today, uh, almost at midnight, uh, please welcome to the show, Dr. Ruth Roberts. Rob, Dr. Billinghurst, I'm so honored to be here. So thanks so much for inviting me on. And yeah, I think we've got pretty much most of the time in the world covered. Afternoon, yeah. evening, morning. That's right. That's right. And you're you're in uh, Austria today, right? That's correct. Yes. Oh, the heavens. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> beautiful. Beautiful. It is. Beautiful. It's lovely. Well, we are we are so excited because uh, I, I want to hit a couple big topics with you today. So I want to talk a little bit about the state of the veterinary, veterinary industry. I would love to talk to you about hormone health and what might be some ways that people can think about their dog's hormones in relation to their longevity and their wellness. Right. And then I'd like to really talk to you about um, the mental happiness of our dogs and um and our animals our our cats as well at home so and then i want to get into what you're doing uh in your business which is fascinating you're coaching all these amazing people all over and um and of course your your um your crock pet diet so it's a lot it's a lot of topics so let's dig into it so the state of the veterinary industry let's start it this way um, it's, we, we've, we've, I'm sure you're, you're as excited as ever because social media has, you know, uh, done all these great, you know, things to bring out, um, all these great people, um, sharing all this great information. Uh, there's always good and bad, um, always with social media, but, you know, I'm sure you've never had the ability to reach the peop the amount of people you've been able to reach. No, it's it's a double-edged sword. I mean, yeah. it, it is amazing. The number of people that I've met via social media platforms, but it, there's also a lot of bad stuff out there in terms of how we interact with each other. So that's, that's critical is to be able to look at a piece of information, assess if it makes sense to you or not, and then move forward. Yeah. So how is it with all of these platforms? Ever, every single one of them. How is it you think of the state of the veterinary industry now compared to 12 years ago? I think there's, like you said, good and bad. So there are so many people like Dr. Billinghurst who's bringing his decades of wisdom and practice and understanding and, uh, and with just really gracious, good information. And there's other folks out there that are just towing the party line of conventional veterinary medicine. Um, it seems like since COVID, things have gotten more intense in terms of you're either with us or you're not with us. And if you're not with us, you tend to get ostracized relatively quickly. And what's what I see happening in veterinary medicine from the conventional side is that our colleagues are incredibly overworked, especially in the United States. I think they don't have enough time to breathe, to have a drink of water, to go to the bathroom, and their frustration level, anxiety level, et cetera, et cetera, is astronomically high. And so when someone disagrees with what the flowchart says, they tend to get a little unhinged. And I think that can go both ways. Um, we've I've seen some of our more holistic co colleagues go off on rants about what's happening on the conventional side. And so I think that's the biggest difficulty is there's not conversation and there's not dialogue happening. In Australia, there's a huge conversation going on at the moment 
about the huge, the enormous suicide rate in veterinary surgeons. And I look at this and I think these people, particularly the youngsters, they come out of school, they've probably had no experience of looking after dogs and cats beyond what they, they've seen their mothers do, which is usually processed pet food. When they go to university, they're trained in processed pet food. Now they're left without any real tools to answer the myriad problems that are occurring because the, most of those problems are occurring really on the basis of this dreadful, and I know I'm pushing my barrow here, but it, it, I can't see it any other way. They're pushing all of that. They're, they're having, having a problem fixing problems because they don't have the basic tool that would fix most of the problems. That's an enormous frustration. And with the enormous rise again in the number of pets being after COVID or, or big people just took on pets because they were locked up. And this is understandable. And the pets did a wonderful job of looking after them in this period. But because they're feeding this terrible food, there are so many problems. So no wonder our vets are overwhelmed. They've got all these cases for which they don't have a real answer beyond drugs and so on, which in turn produce their own problems. And I just thought I wanted to push that point. And I have to agree with you. I mean, if you've got something that you're eating on a daily basis that is creating irritation, inflammation, all of these things that end up having systemic reactions until you remove that thing, things aren't going to get better. But but it is very interesting, too. The um, Arizona Veterinary Medical Association had a study about what is going on in veterinary medicine. Why is it taking so long for people to get care? And what they found was there were adoptions during COVID, but they weren't astronomically higher than normal. And what seems to have happened is that the efficiency of veterinarians has dropped dramatically. And I think that was shocking, right? Um, and so I think what's happened is that many of the younger vets don't have the experience. I think folks our age and, and older, you know, once COVID hit, they're like, to heck with this, I'm retiring. And so the brains of the profession left in less than a year. And so here are these young doctors fresh out of school trying to figure out how the heck to make this work. And they're trained in operating off of flow charts and not in critical thinking. I think that's another massive problem. Absolutely. Yeah. This is this critical thinking thing, because when we came out, it was very much a hands on profession, a really interrogating the pet parent. We called them owners back then. Um, we learned how to interrogate, get a history, and actually determine the most likely thing that's going on. And I see today, all they want to do is draw blood, send it away, and rather than look at the animal, look at a piece of paper that's got all this information on it and try and work it out from there. And, and yes, that's a very slow process. Whereas if you actually train to, to be with some diagnostic acumen, then that's a whole different ballpark. Amen. That's what Dr. Shea said to us. The, the paper has no chi. There's, you know, if, if you're trying to treat the piece of paper, you're going to miss what the animal actually needs. Absolutely. Wow. Do you think that the, uh, as Dr. Billingers brought up the, the topic of suicide and, you know, uh, despair uh, at the very least in the veterinary industry, uh, do you think it's has to do with the, this vertical integration of these big companies that own everything from the food to the veterinary practices to the insurance, the whole, you know, chain. And so they've controlled this, you know, there's, there's very little place for anybody to go if you're practicing veterinary, a traditional practicing veterinarian. Um, this, do you think that's, that's something that Dr. Marsden expressed to me that I thought was really insightful? Do you think that that's, uh, that's the problem? Sure. Absolutely. I mean, if you're, if you're a veterinarian trying to help a, a pet parent with a dog that's had itchy skin for the last five years and you have exactly seven minutes to do that, you cannot possibly accomplish that task and do service to the pet parent or the dog. And, and so that is certainly a big problem. And uh, that's, that's part of what ruined human medicine was the insurance companies and the PPOs and all of that. And then all of a sudden 
The doctors are not making the healthcare decisions. The insurance companies are, and they're giving them about 5% of the time that they need to do it in. The other problem is, and I, I faced this in my young career, is at one point in my first practice, I was euthanizing upwards of five to seven dogs every day. And Ooh. these weren't convenience euthanasias. These were dogs that were, and cats that were sick, sick, sick. And part of it was, you know, the, the pet parent had gone to all of the, all of the diagnostics, all of the testing, and we couldn't help them. But the other part was the pet parents were out of money. And when it's $5,000, to go through basic diagnostics at a uh, in an emergency clinic, that's just bank breaking. You, this is a great segue into a, a download you have about di about um, emergency vet visits. Uh, so tell us a little bit about that. Uh, it's on your website. Yeah. So we some years ago I put together an ebook called "When Not to Go to the ER Vet," and what I tried to lay out was situations that you could probably take care of at home or at least wait until you were able to go to your local veterinarian, your regular veterinarian the next day. And then also clearly delineating the situations which really are true emergencies where you've got to go. And so in, in that little ebook, I try to give folks uh, sort of a first aid kit to pull together before you need it and what to do in certain situations. But I think that sort of asset is not, there's not much of that available. No, you call, I mean, you're like, yeah. you call somebody and they're like, oh, go to the ER vet. And that's kind of the answer you get. Yeah. In my early days, again, as a, as a veterinarian, we had much more free reign for our own thinking outside the box. There wasn't this huge emphasis on evidence-based medicine in the sense that it always had to be based on a study. Um, you, could, you could literally say, hmm, I think that if we did this, even though it may not be what is currently prescribed or what I was taught, but I've got a feeling if we do this, we're going to fix this problem. And we did this. And in fact, there was a forum where where we're encouraged to write up the things that we did that actually worked. Um, what what a, a, an old vet called Tom Hunger said, said was the blood, the guts, and the dung, because he was an old... <laughs> <laughs> the, the blood, the guts, and the dung of veterinary medicine, where you say what you did and the results. And this was a wonderful practical forum. It's kind of disappeared now. It's, it's gone back into evidence-based medicine where we only rely on studies and really that you, you are no longer being a healer. You don't have that. We, I had that feeling we came out, we were healers and that we were designed to be healers. And I wanted to be that. And, and so I, I guess it may have been a romantic idea, but I looked at things and thought about them. And, you know, and this is where we, we, we could come up with, I guess, novel solutions. I don't believe vets are at all allowed to do any of that today. They just have yeah. to as you said, follow a flow chart, do only what is absolutely, rec or well, not recommended, but, but fits in with the current norms, whatever they happen to be. You're, you're absolutely right. And, you know, when I came out of school in 1990, it was still the Wild West. And so that's part of learning how to do things well. Well, you, you get a feeling in your gut that this is the right approach to take, even though the mm. textbook may not say that. But I think the real joke is that on the human side, they've been able to document that less than 11% of the evidence-based recommendations actually have evidence behind them. So that's, <laughs> it's, that's the big joke. I think that you know, people hide behind that banner, but the truth is, is that they're not willing to do the research themselves or to think outside the box. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, Dr. Marsden, again, uh, talking about the subject, he, he says that, the you know, there, there's that quote, the unexamined life isn't worth living. And he likes to tell his patients the unexamined case is not worth treating. And, you know, people mostly get into this profession, the medical profession and, and, and for humans also, 
because they want to solve cases. They want to be detectives. They want to fix, you know, they they like puzzles. They want to, you know, fix real problems. And then they get in and boy, it reminds me of like, I'm a pretty good cook and I was a really good cook when I was young. And, and I thought for like a minute, I wanted to be a chef and I went and worked for a restaurant and I learned exactly what it takes to be a chef is like nothing like cooking for your friends. No, nothing. And I immediately said, okay, this is not, I'm going to just cook for my friends and I'm going to, I'm going to have a great time the way, I, but this, this business is not for me. So what would you say would be, you know, how do you coach your coaches and what would you say for people who are disillusioned with the way this, the current state of the veterinary practice, how could they change their career? How could they change, you know, their state of, of being with, you know, being a veterinarian and, and a healer? It, it takes courage and you have to be willing to walk away from that cushy corporate job, which is probably killing you if you're a veterinarian. Cause I, I mean, God bless them. I, they, I really am happy to not be in their shoes right now, but to have the heart to want to heal, to ask the questions, to keep asking the questions and then keep looking for solutions. This is, just absolutely critical for us to begin to make some differences. We were, you know, we were talking earlier and we'll get to some things about hormones, but I just, I couldn't understand why in 1998, I could take a hemangiosarcoma this big out of a dog and clean the belly out and sew the dog up and it was fine. And five years later, uh, a mass this big, the dog is dead in six months. And so what happened? Um, and that's the, that's the question I kept pursuing to try to find answers to these problems. And so if you've got that rabid curiosity to ferret out a problem, that's where this profession will change. Instead of accepting the status quo, I think you have to be a pioneer in your own right, like Dr. Billinghurst was so many years ago saying, no, this makes absolutely no sense, you guys. We're feeding dogs and cats this food that's just creating horrific health issues. And this is not what these creatures were designed to eat. I just honed in on something you said, Ruth, Dr. Ruth. I remember taking out, and I actually got a picture in the paper that was literally as you described. Now, Mangio Sarcoma was in a basset hound, I believe. What did you find? That's what I'm really curious about because I took out a lot of Mangio Sarcomas in those early days and they all survived beautifully. Um, yes, exactly. T t tell me, what, what, what's the difference that you found? And this is part of it was the change, the co composition of the dry food had changed. And then the other thing is, is when I started practice in 1990 in South Carolina, 10% of the dogs and cats were spayed and neutered. By the time this was coming on, something like 80% of the dogs and cats were spayed and neutered. And so I knew it was somehow related to spaying and neutering along with the, you know, the poor quality ingredients in the, in the commercial foods, but I, I still didn't really know how to tie it together. And so that's part of what I used my training for through Chinese medicine, functional medicine, was to use food as medicine and to use uh, supplements to help support the hormone system, to help support the liver to detoxify better. And what I saw was that these guys with death knell diagnoses, hemangiosarcomas, histiosarcomas, were surviving for way, way longer than any of the specialists would have thought. Yeah, and of course, back when I was doing that, um, at least 50% of the patients were having raw food. It was just what we did in Australia. And it was only fairly, well, at that time that the processed foods were being, uh, were really being marketed aggressively. And of course, having discovered what I discovered, every patient that I treated like that, I pulled out a, an enormous mangiosa or whatever else, I would talk to them about diet. And so we were seeing all sorts of wonderful things happening, but it was kind of just normal for me. So you you obviously came to exactly the same conclusion in so many ways. Yes, absolutely. And I took a bit of a different approach because my because of the training in, in traditional Chinese medicine and went the cooked route. But still, 
the results I was getting versus what the oncologist was getting were night and day. Yes. So, Dr. Roberts, what would you let's just go back to like uh, hormones 101. Why do, why do we care about hormones? What are they doing for us? Uh, keeping everything wrapped up and tight. I mean, if, if we think about what we're doing to dogs and cats, and, and there was a massive pet overpopulation problem. So that it's a double-edged sword, early spaying and neutering. And I was on the bandwagon of spaying and neutering as early as eight weeks for a bit. And then I'm thinking to myself, this is not, cannot possibly be good long-term. But essentially what's happening is our dogs and cats are never endocrine competent. They have never reached a fully mature state by the time most of them are spayed or neutered. And so they are forced into andropause or menopause as early as eight weeks of age in some cases. And I think more veterinarians are now suggesting to wait at least to a year of age. But for instance, on the human side, women with Turner syndrome, which is a uh, genetic abnormality, they essentially, they never become uh, able to produce normal levels of estrogen progesterone. These women are dying at 36 because Ooh. they have never become endocrine competent. Wow. So we're, we're, we're messing with fire and I think the fire has bit us in the butt. Uh, so we're really, this, that's, that's the whole deal. I mean, we can think of the thyroid as the master uh, endocrine gland, but there's, it's probably more the pituitary or the hypothalamus. And when the feedback mechanisms are not present, to tell the pituitary and the hypothalamus to, hey, slow down on production of some of these hormone precursors, that's when the body gets into trouble. So there's no regulation system maintaining homeostasis or balance. You know, it's like, uh, you know, it's very funny how we humans, we, we oversimplify these immensely complex systems, immensely. We don't know a thing about them compared to comparatively to what they are. We know a little bit and uh, we know enough to be dangerous, but it's the same thing with the microbiome. We still don't know a ton on the microbiome, except it is really important. But the, the endocrine system and all your hormones, the, you know, the life that you, you know, your it's, it's the lifeblood of, um, you know, your vitality, your, uh, your soft tissue, uh, and you know, your cartilage, your ligaments, you know, all the, in, in the big dog world, uh, you know, especially goldens and Labradors, I have Labradors, uh, they're all getting these, you know, ACL surgeries at the age of six yeah. because, you know, because they're, uh, mostly their, their testosterone is, you know, dropped. Yeah. And, and that's the thing. I mean, that UC Davis studies, which is now, I think, was done and released in 2013, looking at golden retrievers. One of the most startling things was intact male golden retrievers did not have ACL ruptures. So, you know, the microbiome is incredibly important. But if your endocrine system is never competent, your microbiome never will be either. And so it's, this is the difficulty is that conventional medicine is reductionist to specific isolated little boxes. And if we don't look at all of the boxes, all of the parts as a whole, we're going to miss the whole picture. And I think that's, that's catching up with us. And I, just one more thing, when you said reductionist, perfect, because the other thing that veterinary medicine has done like human medicine is they've compartmentalized everything with all these specialties. And so you never get a team of people. I mean, that could be fine if it were, they all work together in a team and they don't, no matter what, they talk to each other real quick, maybe, but it takes a ton of advocacy from the pet owner's point of view, a ton of work that most people don't even know to do. Yes. And yeah. And so nobody's coordinating all these efforts together to get a real sense in a picture. Everything's all very individual, like compartmentalized. And so like, that's not how you view systems, you know, systems health. 
Mm -mm. No, and that's part of the deal is that theoretically, the general practitioner, your regular veterinarian is supposed to be the quarterback of the team, right? But the regular vet is so overwhelmed and overrun, they cannot possibly, unless they're willing to sleep only two hours a night, keep up with all of these reports coming in from the emergency clinics and the internal medicine specialists and the orthopedists and the cardiologists and all of that to help coordinate patient care. And that's part of, that's part of the difficulty is what do we do now? What do we do to help pet parents know what to do, what questions to ask and where to go next and when yeah. to say yeah. no? Wow. <laughs> you present a very almost insoluble problem uh, in many ways under the present set of circumstances because at least in Australia um, animals have their gonads removed for practical reasons like females that uh, attract well uh, they don't attract every dog in the district like they used to because there are laws about dogs roaming um, but they do uh, they do pass a lot of blood or bloody material and all that stuff that messes up small apartments and so on so my again and sadly my answer comes back to a lot of the problems if we look at a lot of genetic diseases and i'm not talking about things where we have one specific enzyme that absolutely is missing and therefore you have a terrible problem but most genetic diseases are multifactorial in their origin and there's a tendency for an animal to become this way or that way like his kidneys might be weaker if i can put it that way than, than another dog but every one of those those so-called genetic tendencies to disease can be largely overcome simply by taking away the terrible food that's exacerbating them and feeding them real food and again i think that a lot of these problems because only for, and i say this out of my own experience as i listen to what you're saying because the animals that I see that have been transferred to real food as opposed to this, these terrible processed foods, they don't have a lot of these problems. Some of them do to some degree, but mostly those problems are disappear. I, I think that you're absolutely right about the cruciate ligament. That's very, very much a um, uh, probably a hormonal problem to a large degree. But again, I think it's exacerbated by these terrible foods that don't support the growth of strong ligaments. and, and the, and, and I mean, the production, say, of testosterone is not only in the gonads, it's also in the adrenals and that sort of thing. And I think yeah. these, all of these things are better supported by real food because, the, it's, you know, it's just as I say so often, by giving animal, if you had a car, you wouldn't put the wrong fuel and spare parts in, it doesn't work. Anyway, so that's my two bobs worth, as they say in the classics, for, uh, as, I, as I listen to what you're saying, because obviously it's a huge problem because we do need in many instances to take those gonads out simply for very practical purposes anyway and, and, yeah and that's it and so it's coming up with solutions for that but yes. you're absolutely right i mean if we think about and again i go to the human literature because there is none in veterinary medicine um, looking at the impact of lifestyle choices and basically food is a lifestyle choice and so if we look at breast cancer, we all think of it as a genetic disease, right? It turns out that less than 10% of the cases of breast cancer are due to the genetics. The other 90% are due to lifestyle choices. And that is the standard American or standard Western diet, which is highly processed, highly uh, glycemic carbohydrates, sedentariness, excessive alcohol consumption, excessive stress, and so, you know, this is the deal is that for the most part, we have control over our health and we have control over our pets' healths by making better choices for them. Yes. I'm into that. So right it's a really a matter of educating our vets properly and then allowing them to educate their clients. So, Dr. Roberts, how would you think about fixing your, your uh, dog or cat um, what would you feel comfortable? Like my dog, Gus is six going on seven in October and he's not fixed. He's intact and he's, I mean, 
to see him is to is you know I just brought him to a to a um, a friend of mine that's in town and she's like you know wow I mean how old is this dog and everybody says he looks two and uh, he's six and not that six is that old but you know some dogs are are pushing you know they're pushing it at age six seven you know especially the bigger dogs so. Um, you know, I'm, I'm very, he's my first dog that I've ever not fixed. My other ones, I waited till seven to 12 months and they seem to have good long lives, but how would you, how would you talk to a client, um, about, you know, somebody said, should I fix or should I not? How would you talk to them? I think there's a lot of things you have to consider amongst, and sadly amongst them are governmental regulations and And it is difficult in uh, U.S. society, and it sounds like probably in in Australian society as well, to have an intact pet because most pet parents have, I mean, most veterinarians don't even remember the health concerns that would go with having an intact pet. So you have to be prepared for different, um, different training methods. Many of the boarding kennels will not accept intact pets. And so you have to think all of these things through. So for instance, a a dear friend of mine is in her late seventies and in in her infinite wisdom, she and her husband got a Weimaraner puppy. And so they, for them, they've decided that it's better to neuter this dog younger because of his Uh, high energiness and that sort of thing so that he is easier for them to handle. So there's many, many, many things you have to consider. If it's possible, I would not neuter or spay um, with the understanding that there's the possibility for the female dogs to develop a pyometra or uterine infection and for the male dogs to develop prostatitis and potentially prostate cancer down the road and mammary cancer for the female dogs. So there are some downsides, but I have to say that um, I saw far fewer cases of pyometra back in my early career than I see cases of lymphoma, hemangiosarcoma, osteosarcoma on a regular basis. So If you do need to spay and neuter, you just need to understand the steps to take uh, to prevent disease from happening. And first and foremost of which is to feed real food. Yeah, but there are, uh, you know, if you get into those issues with uh, a male or female that has not been fixed, uh, there's pretty easy remedies. I mean, you just, you, you know, you, you could, and, and on that occasion, you know, like, my, my veterinarian said to me, well, if he gets, there, there's a chance he'll get testicular cancer possibly, but we'll just snip them off if he gets it. And, you know, he's no more worse off than, you know, having had them snipped off from the beginning. So, um, and so there are ways that, you know, it's good to just think through these things, I think is the point. And um, I've never seen any uh, aggressive behavior from uh, my dog. I think that has a lot to do with the way you train them and how happy they are. We need to get into that topic here soon too. Oh, Rob, that's absolutely right. The the training thing of of intact animals, that's, this has been running through my mind. So I'm just going to say, yes, amen to that. Yes. And my dog is very trained and, uh, and he's, you know, very, um, I spend a lot of time and energy with him, but I'll get off my situation. I have had thought long and hard about, being with other dogs, what I do find is some dogs, he's never aggressive, never has been with any dogs. In fact, dogs are trying to steal his ball all the time. It's his favorite thing in the world, and he's never ball aggressive. But some dogs don't love a dog that's intact. And so you have to think about that part. So it is interesting how you think through, you know, okay, am I going to go to dog parks? Am I going to the, the point you brought up about boarding facilities, very good point. Um, some some people will just be like, no, you got a German Shepherd that's intact. No, thank you. You know, and it, it's discriminatory, but you know, what are they going to do? You know, they, they've got a lot Their of dogs. Insurance, it's the insurance companies. The insurance companies won't cover them. And that's, yeah. I mean, there it is. It's the money. Just keep following the money. Keep following the money. So can we get into 
uh, a relate the relationship we have with our dogs because this thing that you and I talked about some time ago, I just thought was fascinating and all the, you know the the COVID animals that got adopted and all of us on our phones and we see this we see this lack of um, attention with parents and their kids. We, everybody knows these people um, that are, you know, their hand, they're, they're, you know, they're buried in their phones and they're, you know, the kids that swim practice and it's like, literally like, mom, look at me. I just did the dive and oh, honey, that's great. You know, um, yeah. but it's happening to our dogs. And, you know, some people might roll their eyes listening to this going, oh, give me a break. Like, that's why I have a dog or a cat. They don't care. Do they care? Of course they do. I mean, if so to your point about training, that's part of why intact animals are difficult to have in U.S. society because we're all here, right? Yeah. And so you have to pay attention. And, you know, you have to pay attention to this six-month-old puppy that's starting to get bursts of hormones, just like you need to pay attention to your 12-year-old son or your 12-year-old daughter who are starting to have some different feelings because they're getting bursts of hormones as well. Yep. But, you know, if you think about what the social media companies know, they know that different types of sounds, movements, pictures will cause different types of hormones to be released in us, oxytocin, dopamine, all of that stuff. And so that's part of what it keeps us addicted to our phone. But along with that, we feel this anxiety when you know, we see something we don't like or some not enough people like this post we made. And unfortunately, our pets are sitting right there with us, feeling all of these rapid changes in our emotions and our responses to this little thing in our hands. So I think as our anxiety level goes up, being in this social platform, whatever it is you choose, uh, their anxiety goes up. And we're not being present with them. We're not being present with ourselves. And often we're not present with our children or our spouses or anybody else in the room with us. Well, our, it's, what you're getting to the heart of, I think, is the, the disconnectedness of us with others. And that includes our pets. Sure. Yeah. And, and if you think about it, many children, the way they respond to this is the only way they can get attention from the parents is to behave badly. Act and out. so I think that's part of what our pets are doing. That's the only time we stop, we put the box down and yell at them instead of, <laughs> I don't know, stop that, Fido. You know, it, it, and that's terrible because what we're doing is training them that that's the behavior that gets our attention. On a side note, um, you said Fido. Uh, yes, Doctor B, Dr. B and I, Doctor B and I talk about how why why do we always use Fido? But you've never met a dog named Fido ever. I have. I did. I did. You but it did. was I, it was spelled the Cajun way, so it was like P I D E A U X, and I was like, oh, that's clever. Okay. <laughs> that's yeah, good. Fido and Fluffy, right? We always say that for for male and female dogs. Yeah, yes, I, I don't know. Fluffy. So fluffy. let's let's oversimplify this for people. So on a scale of one to 10, 10 being the most affected, what number would you put on, let's say dogs, um, on their feeling, their awareness, their the impact on them of being disconnected from them? P part of that depends on the dog and the personality, but... Yeah. Uh, I mean, easily an eight uh, for almost every dog, I think. Yeah. You know, if you've got a bored Labrador that's just, that's so, that's driven to be with you, to do things with you, and they're just totally blown off, their stress level is just astronomical. I've done this. I've done this where um, my dog likes to, he celebrates for, I'm not joking, a good 90 minutes after he's been fed. So he's on his, he's on his feet pacing. We, we, we pace. I'll, I'll usually sing some song. I mean, I know this sounds ridiculous, 
but I'll just make up a song. He He's very sing-songy. He loves, he responds to music. So I'm, I'll, I'll walk around usually with my phone. He's behind me and he, he follows me around the house and I'm doing my emails or I'm doing things. Okay. That's not bad. That's not, I don't think that's that bad. He's happy. But when I sit down and I throw the ball for him a little bit and then I'll, my, my phone will ring and I'll attend to something. He'll go, he goes down to his bed and he puts his head down. He's impacted. Yeah. Heavily. And that like kills me. And I go, God, what was I thinking? What, what, what happened? But he's like, dad, this obvious. was our special time. Come on, man. Yeah. So, but he's a sensitive dog. I, I have had dogs that are less sensitive, but he's a sensitive dog. And I think you're right. It does depend on the dog, but you're saying at least an eight is what you would say out of 10. Yeah. 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 I, I think that's a really good, uh, a correct number. Okay. So, um, can we go to real quick? I want to just give people some ideas and it does depend on the state you live and laws and all of this stuff. What alternatives are there to preserving hormones? We'll go back to hormones, preserving hormones, or if your dog is already, you adopted a dog and the dog has been, you know, um, uh, fixed, you know, let's just say, um, what can we do? to bring life back into that dog and get a better, you know, endocrine system. There's a myriad of things. And and so first and foremost is food, 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 food. And second is support the liver so that it can clear excess levels of, of luteinizing hormones and, and other toxins as well. And then for elderly pets in particular, uh, there's a, gentleman, Dr. Bieber, who has a site, Dogosterone, and essentially what he is doing is using testosterone injections for elderly pets, and the difficulty is uh, testosterone is a controlled substance, and so the FDA wants you to be compliant in the way in which you use this, and so in veterinary medicine, we can use this for frail senior dogs and for dogs with uh, muscle wasting that are developing arthritic complications secondary to this. So that's an option. It, he's training veterinarians how to, to use testosterone safely in the practice. Somebody's got to develop hormone replacement therapy. I yeah. mean, the idea is that not to get you back to where at levels where you were when you were 20 for humans, but to get you to levels where you feel like yourself again. And I think we can do that for pets, but the interest isn't there currently because probably a drug ma- drug manufacturer has not figured out how to make money off of it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, first of all, that's amazing. You know, people can send their veterinarians to that website, Doggos- Doggosterone. Um, you know, we know people are doing this in their own lives, you know, I'm 51 and my, probably cause I've been an entrepreneur my whole life. Um, my testosterone was down, down to the 350 level at one point. And I didn't want to take, I wanted to stave off as long as I could doing these injections of, you know, of testosterone. So I found these combination of herbs and it brought it up to 750. Right on. I mean, that's a big, that is a huge jump and that's a super healthy level. I don't need them being 2000. I don't need to, you know, rip off, you know, door handle as I'm turning it, you know, uh, and, you know, but I think the, the big thing is to think is to know that there are places to go and places to look and, and places to turn. And it's not hard. Um, it's just that you you want to be able to pull on that thread a little bit and and find the right people. Maybe it's even, you know, phone consultations. Right. And, and that's kind of it. I mean, we were talking about the veterinary shortage earlier, and that's one of the that's been my project for the last year is I developed something called a holistic pet health coach certification program modeled on health coaching on the human side. And essentially what's happened on the medical field, both in conventional medicine and functional medicine, is that the doctors have deferred the education piece, the support piece, how to make the lifestyle choices part to health coaches. And so what I've been doing is training uh, the majority 
of my students have been women, but training them with the basics of what I know and then continuing to offer them support as they start to work with cases. I hope, um, and interestingly enough, the course is certified for 40 hours of continuing education for veterinarians and veterinary technicians. My hope is that our colleagues in the veterinary profession will say, yes, I need somebody to come in and help these patients with chronic disease, with dietary choices, with supplement choices, with understanding what to do next when this thing comes up. And I think that is going to be critical to help alleviate the shortage of veterinary care and also to offer pet parents the ability to actually understand what's going on with their pets and to have a ear to lean on. What do I do next? What do I ask the vet at the next appointment? Yeah, yeah, that's great. Um, <laughs> it's, it, you know, it reminds me of, um, in the human world, all the life coaches that exist. And, you know, it's not for me to decide who the best ones are and who aren't. And, you know, there's, there's somebody for everyone, but there are some very unqualified life coaches there. I know, I know, I know these people, their, their lives are a mess. And so I have to believe that if you just let all these quote health coaches for, for pets go, if you just let it go rogue, you know, you, you'd probably, be in a situation where you just have a bunch of unqualified people. So I'm so happy that you're at the helm of that and, and, and helping keep that, you know, quality up. That makes me feel better. <laughs> yeah. It's, and, and that's the thing is my, my goal is to talk to more and more of our veterinary colleagues to get their input on this situation. I, it's not something I want to do by myself. This needs to be a profession wide push because the veterinary shortage is not going away anytime soon. And I think this is one of the very few ways we can alleviate the distress that veterinarians are having uh, and get pet parents the help that they actually need. But yeah. uh, Dr. Ruth, listening to all of that, our veterinarians themselves have no training in this area. Is that, you are saying that, aren't you? Yes, they don't. And they don't have time or the, or the wherewithal to take the training. And, you know, I think it's important that, that somehow in the curriculum, they at least have that, have that training, even if, even if they can't offer it themselves, so they know where to direct patients and, and when to direct patients. They have to have some understanding of that. It, it's, yes. it's primary to their thinking if they're going to be effective as veterinarians, I believe. It, it must be, at least, they must have some understanding of that. So really, this is very much, I and mean, what you're doing is, is fabulous, but really it needs to be incorporated into the curricula of, 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 of uh, training vets. Just Absolutely. Thing. Absolutely. And that's the, that's the thing, is my, my first goal is to get a critical mass of coaches and have them start working with veterinarians. And I'm so happy... Um, we have 15 people that have graduated. One woman is already working with her veterinarian in Wisconsin. Another student is probably going to be working with two veterinarians in her small town in South Carolina. And this is the only way that we can start to get this to change. But you're absolutely right, Dr. Billinghurst, is we've got to get this into the profession. And I think the young students um, in veterinary school are willing to start learning this, or at least learn how to utilize a paraprofessional like this. Mm. Dr. Roberts, don't you think some of this is just vets not thinking that people will pay for this? I mean, it's incredible. So there's two things that I think you could you could monetize, and that's not a bad word. Mm -mm. Uh, the, the education that everybody needs at your current rate. And you might say, well, gee, you know, I'm a vet and I don't think it's right to charge, you know, uh, my $300 that I charge, whatever the number is uh, for my, my consult time because I'm not treating something. Well, I would disagree. I would say that, you know, it depends on where you are. And, you know, you could charge a fraction of that, a, par a part of that, most of that, or all of it, if you brought value to your customers. And 
Absolutely. You would, you would incentivize people. If I was paying you $300 to learn, I'll tell you something right now. I would learn fast. Yes. I wouldn't be coming back to you for five visits. I would get that down. I would be taking notes. I would be sitting and listening to you, and I would be taking action on that. And that's an incentive structure that I think most people are just dismissing that, oh, gee, no one's going to pay for that. Well, you don't, you don't know that, you know. Well, and I think, I think the, part of the other issue is, sorry, yeah. Part of the other issue is we're taught to be competitors instead of colleagues. And so that's that's mm -hmm. one of the things. And then two, we don't value our own time. The drug companies have taught us that the value is in the prescriptions, the vaccinations, Bingo. the tests, not in our brains. Bingo. Yes. The thing I wanted to just jump in very quickly is that most of the problems, because they relate to lifestyle, this is the area the vet needs to be thinking very critically and understand it because that is value for money because you're actually getting to the heart of the problem. That's just so important. I, I noticed that very early on in my career. Nothing fitted into the textbook diagnostic picture uh, because every situation was different and you had to dig into every situation. Why do you do that with your own? What do you, what's this going on here? And you can often figure it out and, and, no drugs, just a change in lifestyle. Often yeah. came back to diet, of course, but it was a, it's a lifestyle thing. It's, that is valuable. That's worth money. It's gold. That's right. And to have somebody that can teach you how to do that and help you figure out what is the right diet for your dog? Is it raw? Is it cooked? Is it lightly cooked? Is it freeze dried? I don't know. But this is the difficulty is, okay, if you're seeing this little thing, this probably isn't quite the right tack to take. Let's pivot and try this instead. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Is it is it is it a Chinese medicine diet? Is it you know uh, uh, what what supplements natural or synthetic or whatever can go into it? I don't know. I think you know if there's any young vets listening to this, and I hope there are that you know are still open to changing their life and their career and the direction of their professional career. Uh, I'd say just expand your, your, your paradigm because um, people will pay for it and you'll find your audience. Amen. Actually, and that, yeah, that was one of my big frustrations is there's so many veterinarians that'll take an acupuncture course and that's where the holistic education stops. Mm. And my goal with this was to give veterinarians five more facets to add to their practice. Unfortunately, the profession is so overwhelmed that that's not who took me up on the offer. I think a practice, if there's a large practice and it's all conducting conventional medicine and vets are highly trained, they need within that structure to have somebody who is a lifestyle coach for animals that understands all this. It should be part of the practice. I say, right, now I'm going to get you to go and speak to this person because they are going to direct you in a, and, and they've got more time than I and you're going to pay for this. But it's worth it because this is going to this will stop you coming back to see me for drugs. This is going to actually right. fix the problem because we know where the problem is, but, but it's there, and this is the person now that's going to help you. Eddie, I mean, I would even go a step further if I had a veterinary practice or a couple practices. I'd say, look, uh, if you're not comfortable feeding X diet at least and doing you know that's not processed, uh, you can't be in my practice unless you get coached. I'm not right. treating. I'm not treating these sick animals. There's not enough arrows in my quip. Your, what is that? Quivers in yeah. my arrow. Um, <laughs> that, that arrows I can, in your quiver. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, that's right. Um, that I can. You know. I'm and I'm not going to be fighting this fight that is is almost impossible to win when you've got a, a bad foundation laid for your animal. So I would just say, look, you know, I'm uh, just so you know. This is our first consultation, and this is how I this is how I roll, you know. And if you don't like that, you can go down the street. Yeah. Well, and 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 even even for the conventional veterinarians that they're getting all these questions from their their clients. I doc, I I have heard that the hills is just not good stuff, and I want to feed raw, but I don't know how to do it, or I want to home cook, but I don't know how to do it. And instead of saying, then the doctor then can then say, well, go talk to. Uh, Melissa over here and she'll work with you to find the diet that's right for your pet. 
And Melissa yeah. doesn't have to be there. <laughs> no, Melissa can be on a Zoom call just like we are. I mean, yes. we're, we're, we are literally on three different continents having a conversation. This is a beautiful thing about technology. Yep, yep. Well, I know it's getting much later. You know, it's very late for you. We're almost at an at our hour. So I want to finish with your, we've talked about your, your um, you know, educational services, which I think are phenomenal. But we also want to talk about your croc pet diet. So talk to us about that. So the, the short story is that I had a dog with bacterial endocarditis, just as I was learning acupuncture and starting that process. And we got her through it with conventional, the conventional way with antibiotics and all of this. And so I took her with me to my next class and they said, okay, well, here are the herbs that'll work. Here are the points you might try. And you need to home cook for this dog. And so uh, Dr. Roger Clemens at the Chi Institute gave me a very basic diet and we went back home. This dog would not let me needle her. She was mm -mm, not having it. I could do acupressure and that was sort of it for you know five or 10 seconds. She was sort of a goosey dog. She thought the herbs were okay. She thought the cooked food was a stellar idea. And literally on ultrasound, I watched as a a lesion this big, so that's about uh, about a centimeter in diameter on our mitral valve, disappeared down to three millimeters. And that is not supposed to happen. This dog developed bacterial endocarditis at nine. She lived to be 13. So that convinced me that this was, I had to change. I had to start talking to my clients about it. And so I had a very basic diet built out. The first pet food recall hit in 2007, and that recipe was flying off the shelves. Mm -hmm. And what happened was, once the pet food recall was over, is that the itching stopped, the diarrhea stopped, the limping stopped, and I couldn't go back. I put, took all of the commercial food out of my office. That was it. So it's had several modifications along the way. I've incorporated principles of functional medicine as well. And then we will modify it specifically for that pet. And often we'll use testing to see what foods the pet's sensitive to, to really hone in on it. So the goal is to have a home cooked diet that is made in batches so that you can freeze it and have the convenience of the bag of food in terms of being able to dip something out of the refrigerator, feed your pet and get it done on a consistent and easy basis. The, the goal is for the pet parent to make this at home uh, with, so we're doing all sorts of things in terms of uh, reducing environmental impact as well as providing a healthy, fresh diet for these dogs and cats. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> I think it really <laughs> speaks of just how bad processed pet food is. Because, and let's face it, years ago, that's what people did. They just cooked for themselves and their dogs. And right. we didn't have these horrendous disease problems we have now. People are astonished when I just point something out to them very simple. All those dogs sitting in the waiting room with all those dreadful problems, what are they eating? Hmm. Oops. Garbage. Garbage. <laughs> Literally. Up yeah. Upcycled food. Yeah. And and this ultra processed food, so that's what they're eating. And and we still convinced that this is the best way to feed our dogs. Come on. Let's <laughs> well, wake up. Yeah, we have to stop we have to stop this idea that uh to feed your dog is is a needs to be super in uh, super convenient and super easy and fast you know going in and getting a cup to scoop two scoops out and throwing it in a bowl maybe you add some water maybe you add something else if the dog's lucky i'm sorry that is an absolutely horrific bar i mean wh where would you do this to your kids you feed your kids cereal every day Sadly, this happens. <laughs> you know, they start with cereal and then finish up with uh, Kraft macaroni and cheese. So, I mean, it's it's yeah. a global problem. Uh, oh, gosh. Well, 
uh, we have to get out of that. And so I like to say, so let me ask you this, uh, from a person's perspective, who's not ever made their own pets food. Um, I, and I, I do raw, so I don't normally cook, uh, my dog's food, but like, what is this smell like when you're doing this crock pot all day? Tell me about that. It depends on what you're cooking. Fish can be a little, little dicey. So we, we, we do that recipe a bit differently, but there are, dogs that are tortured for eight hours while the food is cooking. I, I have clients that would tell me the dog is sitting in the kitchen drooling. Oh my God. Um, and, you know, and so basically it's a slow cooked pot roast uh, for lack of a better description and it's human food. So we, I had another guy that said, yeah, <laughs> yeah, he and he and his dog Bettina love to sit down and have dinner together. And so he put, you know, some on her bowl and some on his plate and they'd have supper. So it, you know, it smells like a slow cooked meal. That's great. That's awesome. I love that idea. So, uh, so this guy would eat the same food. He would make it for, for his dog too. Oh, okay. That's cool. Is that what, is that what, is that what a lot of people do? Do they, um, they just don't make it with onions and things that are toxic to dogs? Exactly. Exactly. Not a lot of spices. Um, and, and part of it is, you know, just you add a little salt to it and it gets it to where your taste buds want to be. Yeah. On your plate. Yeah. Well, that's great. Well, that's, this is great. Uh, Dr. Roberts, this has been amazing. And thank you for staying up very late for you with us. We really appreciate it. So where do you want people to find you? That's it. DrRuthRoberts.com. That's where all of the information is. Um, sign up for the newsletter uh, reach out to my staff. They'll be happy to send you a copy of when not to go to the ER vet. Uh, and we've got lots of holistic pet health protocols available at no charge in our uh, courses area. So there's a boatload of information to, uh, to get started with. Yeah. Make sure you sign up for uh, Dr. Robert's newsletter because that's where it, really it all starts. And then you'll be in contact uh, with them. Um, for all the and the, and the future uh, handouts that you have for people, which are super invaluable, and they're and guess what, folks, they're free. You know, there's going to be stuff that she's giving out because she wants to change the world. So, um, well, thank you very much for being with us. We really appreciate it. It is yeah, my so pleasure. Thank you for me too. Um, I, you know, it's wonderful, and and I think Rob too for introducing me to all these wonderful people. And we get I get to listen to the, their wisdom and learn more every day because we're all students. And uh, so thank you for your wisdom. And it's been a real pleasure uh, talking to you and hearing your wisdom. So thank you. And, and it's an honor for me to meet you, sir. Well, have a great day, everybody. Thank you for joining us. And uh, we'll be seeing you soon. Bye, everybody. Amen. Bye. Bye.